All right, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. For those of you new to Blockchain Acceleration Foundation, our mission is to accelerate the global adoption of Web3 and the user owned internet. So, BAF is a decentralized, autonomous, nonprofit organization that supports university blockchain clubs with building accredited courses, weekly meetups, international conferences, fundraising, collaborations, research, hackathons, contributing talent to companies within the blockchain ecosystem, and more. And we're also supported by industry leaders like Nier and Algorand. My name is Makai. I'm the president of Suffolk University Blockchain and currently leading partnerships and club acceleration at BAF. So we want today's event to be really inclusive and hear everybody's feedback and everyone's questions. So feel free to ask any questions during the Q&A period after the main talk. So we'll get started. Joining us for the conversation is Cameron Dennis. Cameron is the co-founder of BAF and the founder of Banyan Collective. So welcome, Cameron. Uh, we'd love to hear a bit more about your background and your crypto journey. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, always good to be speaking at the uh, nonprofit I, I founded. So uh, it's good to meet all of you, a lot of new faces, which is beautiful. Um, my name is Cameron Dennis. I got involved in the Ethereum ecosystem like back in 2016 or so. I read the white paper, blew my mind. I'm like, holy crap, uh, this is going to change how ownership is managed across the world. Um, my logic at the time was the, the incentives of the world aren't inherently broken. The... Uh, the world is, inherent, is not inherently broken. It's the incentives that power it. And money is kind of that root incentive. And so with programmable money, really what Ethereum introduced, uh, we're able to essentially program the incentives to realign uh, the world. Um, so that was uh, my main motivation. And then so that got me started to uh, start the blockchain club at UC Santa Barbara uh, back in 2018 slash 2019. And um was just focused on teaching people. Like I saw this thing and I'm like, holy crap, we need more people to learn about this. And so uh, ran that club during that time, uh, didn't actually, we were trying to raise money from external partners who wanted to donate to us in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And uh, there was no way for the university to actually allocate tax deductions to the donors. So uh, because they weren't able to like custody crypto themselves. So we were like, well, why don't we just like create our own nonprofit and uh, get a 501c3 status to essentially issue tax deductions to the donors of the, our club? And then we very quickly realized that this was a problem that a lot of other universities also had. Um, and so I got a job uh, working as a uh, just VC analyst uh, for a wonderful man named Brian Fox. Uh, Brian is the uh, author and founder of the Bash Shell, for those who know what the bash is uh, he wrote it and he's a guy in uh santa barbara he's super active in the like local entrepreneurial community uh worked for his uh pretty small like vc fund at the time doing analyst work part-time and i told him like hey i really want to start this nonprofit uh to work with a bunch of other universities to kind of facilitate it's not just donations but more collaboration um with all these different blockchain club leaders because we all suffer kind of from the same same problems um, so he was like, hell yeah, got me a lawyer, um, uh, pro bono. And that's really how BAF got started. Um, and at the time I didn't want to live anywhere. Uh, I kind of saw this like dream of being a nomad in like crypto land. So, uh, I just had my, you know, sedan, uh, car, some Volkswagen and, uh, lived out of my car for about a year going from university to university, uh, onboarding their blockchain clubs to this, you know, kind of ephemeral organization called BAF. Um, my best friend from like childhood, he randomly moved to California, just graduated school as well. His name is Philip Strauss. Huge shout out to him. He essentially helped me get all of like the legal paperwork figured out and was essentially like the, he's actually just until recently, the, the corporate secretary and, uh, you know, helped get everything off the ground. So we were just hustling for about a year until I met a guy named Pier Giacomo Palmisani. Uh, he messaged me on LinkedIn and uh, straight from Italy, he was like, hey, I want to get more involved in crypto. Um, I'm, I'm a student at UC Irvine's Extension School, and uh, want, I'm going, he's going to UCSB for his master's the following year. So he ended up, uh, I'm like, hey, why don't you actually run the club? We needed a leader at the time. Uh, and we'll talk more about like leadership changes and stuff because it's so important to have Sorry. like a successor. Um, and so PG was down to do the Black um, Club at UCSB. Uh, and uh, from there, you know, BAFs just continue growing and growing and growing, uh, more clubs, more initiatives, starting more courses. And here we are today, uh, lots of clubs. Um, my goal was always to like 
honestly, I'm, ton- I'm tired of the bullshit. I'm so t- sick and tired of like the crap in the space. So we were always focused on like quality over quantity. We we're never really interested in just like throwing a bunch of logos on our website just for the sake of throwing logos on the website. Like we want to provide real value. And so um, that was pretty much like the core of our mission was like provide actual value uh, specifically by starting develop accredited blockchain development courses. And then long story short, uh, built with worked with all these layer ones through Bath. learned about near uh blew my mind i was like sharded blockchains are the future uh, we need flexible key management kind of solves all these prerequisites with like wasm based and all the stuff and uh then uh got a job at uh, the near foundation uh just focused on like business development work uh and been there for the last two years and still running bath doing the thing trying to scale scale the open web hopefully that's a lot awesome yeah. So yeah, I mean, let's let's take a step back a little bit. During your time at UC Santa Barbara, uh, you were the founder or co-founder of the Blockchain Club. There, uh, I think you grew that to over six hundred mem- members. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, at the time, we were just kind of focused on like hyper growth. Like, how do we get as many people to learn about the open web as as possible? Um, and we actually realized that that was the wrong approach. Um, cause we got all these people signed up. I was handing out cookies, uh, like during the club fairs and I would literally scream out cookies and crypto, like come and learn, blah, blah, blah. Um, got people to sign up, just give me your email. We'll send you a follow up. uh, you know, get them to join the email list and, uh, realized that was not the best approach. Um, cause we had all these people in the part of the club, but they weren't actual like contributors. They might come here and there to a workshop, but like they weren't really, uh, dedicated nor really in, into it for the right reasons. And this is a huge distinction between like people just interested in this space for trading versus people who are sort of like eager to build the open internet. Um, and so we attracted a lot of those traders and that was decent for the time being, but uh, you know, nothing against trading, it's awesome. Like that's how I got involved originally, but uh, you know, it, it's very transactional. Uh, so the goal there was to then sort of take a little bit of a step back, you know, establish a good leadership team and sort of like focus on starting accredited courses. Because the problem, even though we ran workshops frequently, our, fr- our workshops weren't, t- to be honest, totally well attended, despite having like, I think at the peak, it was like 800 members. And so why is that? Well, and what we realized, it was um, the lack of actual accreditation. Students are busy as hell. Uh, if you really want them to be tied in, like you need to align, you need to incentivize them, whether it be money or credits or something. And so we couldn't pay people like formally through the school. So we thought credits was the best option. Tons of bureaucracy with the school as everyone here has probably navigated at some point. Um, and so uh, we then uh, figured out some loopholes to to get some courses started. But yeah, that was the, the TLDR. Yeah, I think, you know, there's so much hype surrounding crypto and it is really a matter of incentives and aligning in incentives as a club leader. What were some of like the key steps you took to both navigate the tricky kind of nuances of academia and also get those busy students um, interested and motivated beyond the monetary incentives? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the people who see the vision, one, it starts with values. Like you gotta, you start with values because that's really what's going to attract the right people who are in it for the right reasons and will stick around. Um, and for us, we there was two blockchain clubs, and I'm, I'm assuming a few of you might have a few cryptocurrency organizations on campus. And so um, I was always a fan of like working together. It's about the open web, but like the sort of mission of the clubs were different. One was for trading, one was for education. Um, and so, or like more distributed systems, you know, more CS related stuff. Um, and so working with the other club was actually a good, a good thing. Like I highly recommend trying to bridge gaps between competing organizations. To be honest, none of this actually, like it matters, like which the work that you do matters, but like the competitions really don't, um, cause you graduate and things stop mattering <laughs> in that regard. The goal is to actually really get, identify people's skills and interests and provide them opportunities to like stick around in the space. Um, so, uh, working with other clubs was one, two, uh, is working with like PhD students or grad students generally, uh, PhD students and grad students are very busy, but they have a closer ear to the professors and are the ones that can actually get the courses listed. 
um, because it's actually pretty straightforward to find if you if your school has a computer science department that has uh, distributed systems uh, courses, which most of them do. Uh, a lot of these professors are interested in seeing their research come to life and like kind of hit the market for the first time. You know, yes, large large scale databases have been around for a little bit, but um, a lot of people were talking like have been researching for a long time um, around like more permissionless uh, fault tolerant systems, and so having them sort of see this industry as a manifestation of their honestly lifelong work is super compelling to them. The issue is that they don't know the they don't have the industry knowledge. So what we needed to do is like as the hungry kind of DGen students try to bridge that gap by building the curriculum, getting them to list the class, bringing the student body to the actual fill the class. And um, the hardest thing is the TAs. So um, we'll unpack that in a bit, but like to align incentives, it was really just about uh, getting the accredited courses started and or uh, trying our best to get people jobs. And if we have one or two success stories and actually market those success stories, um, it does spread like wildfire. Because as everyone here probably is looking or once is an amazing internship during the summer. And so if we can have some solid wins and get those people internships, um, they tell their friends naturally and their mom and their grandma and kind of everyone in between uh, about the space. So that was always like the goals, like jobs and courses. Yeah. And it seems like traditionally universities have been kind of at this like precipice of innovation for deep technology. I mean, in the early days of the web, um, you know, you had somebody like Mark Andreessen building Mosaic, you know, in his university. And I think, you know, blockchain clubs actually have this opportunity to be this center for, um, you know, the the web three next phase of, of great innovation. Um, and, you know, within that, what are some of the ways that um, you as a club leader tried to kind of uncover that and, and really um, try to gather those students together? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll take a little bit of a step back. Uh, the world, the future is, and I'm not going to say bleak, but a lot of young people think that the future is bleak. You know, we have uh, increasing climate change impacts. We have, you know, uh, civil conflicts emerging around the world. There's like a lot of issues um, and a lot of us feel responsible for, you know, solving those problems. And so like trying to find those kind of like inherent problem solvers is step one. Um, not saying that like they need to build in blockchain space right away. It's just understanding like why are they saw why are they doing the things that they're doing? Um, and then in crypto, it's so broad that you can actually like I can pitch a environmental science student despite Bitcoin's carbon emissions, uh, why blockchains and the open web is important. And making it less about um, you know, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency and more focusing on the open internet and how that can provide people with the option to verifiably own their money, data, and governance without a third party is compelling to most people. And so it's understanding like what your target market is really interested in and sort of framing the uh, the material to their interests. And so, um, yeah, just starting with like some pretty basic, I mean, this is like common in marketing uh, tactics around in any industry, just like understanding your customer, like who is who is the who is the client, um, what is what is what are their names, what departments are they in, what are they what do they do for fun in their spare time, where do they shop at the grocery store, like all these kind of weird questions will give you the answers to what kind of curriculum you should be developing for your club. So we did that, um, and fortunately, like I'm just lucky enough to kind of had a entrepreneurial entrepreneurial background beforehand where I was taught these frameworks. And I was essentially just apply these startup frameworks to a club because um, it is a startup. Like all these blockchain clubs are essentially startups in, in some regard. Um, you don't need to go raise a bunch of money and you don't need to like, you know, pay people. But um, you are starting something super new um, and it's very easy to turn your, you know, activities of your blockchain club to a consultancy or a recruiting firm or, you know, whatever the hell it really is. So um, I would say even like start thinking of these clubs like as startups themselves, because it's you need to put in if you to do it success, successfully, you do need to put in as much time as it takes to run a startup, um, which is a lot. So I know I kind of went everywhere with that question, but uh, hopefully it answered it. I mean, looking at clubs and startups is a fantastic kind of mental model for for operating a club. And, you know, this is just the Cambrian phases of blockchain, um, I mean, this could go in so many different directions, right? This is a lot more than Bitcoin. This is a lot more than 
um, you know, ETH and we've already seen ETH transferring to the proof of stake. And I mean, so much is happening, right? And we're in a bear market right now and developers are shipping so much. Um, I mean, there's just so much innovation going on. Um, but, you know, with clubs, looking looking at clubs through the lens of startups, uh, there's kind of this idea of a flywheel, right? For a startup. What is the kind of core actions that you take to succeed? And, you know, clubs have so many different focus areas. Uh, one university might be developer focused. Another university might be law focused. Um, you know, another university might be business focused. So, you know, for club leaders, how, how might you find a flywheel for your club um, that is aligned with the mission of your school and the student body of your school? Yep. I start with market research. Like you need to do market research. Um, like in any startup, it's the same, same sort of practice. Um, and yeah, kind of getting back to like what they want uh, is super important. You can't, force a bunch of business students to care about cryptography. Um, they're probably not, they're just not going to care. Um, and so, uh, I mean, some of them might actually, some of them might find some newfound interest in it, but um, at the end of the day, you need to sort of cater to their interests. Um, or if, if you're not interested in their interests, like find people who have your interests and build smaller communities. People like to try to build these like huge blockchain clubs with hundreds of people I actually look at what we did, even though it was successful by gaining a lot of people as a mistake. Like we didn't have that core crew of people to ship products or even build content um, consistently. It was always a little bit of a hassle to like get the leaders to do things. Um, and I'm assuming everyone here has sort of felt this in some regard. Uh, so really understanding like what makes someone tick, like why are they doing this? And if they're doing it for clout, um, I can almost assure everyone in this call is not doing this for clout because you wouldn't do it. Uh, you wouldn't volunteer your time outside of running the club to come and learn this stuff uh, because, uh, you know, people just don't do that. So really having a filter for, for people chasing clout and actually like trying to actually build something interesting is, I think, super, super important. Same thing for a founder. Like if you're a founder of a company or co-founder of a company and you're doing it for clout, you're going to fail as a founder. Like you're, you will fail. Um, and so, yeah, making sure that the, there's one, a very clear, you know, your target market Two, if you don't fully know your tar target market, you can pretty much like go for a very large top of funnel and just onboard, like have a basic membership application where you just collect their, again, name, contact skills and interests to understand that market, to do that market research. And then from there, filter that that giant top of funnel and that type of funnel can be a, again a form that takes you 35 seconds a minute to fill out at a booth at you know your club club day on campus um that's where you start really understanding like what you should be doing in order to provide your uh members or users or whatever the fuck you want to call them uh things that they want and so uh that's where i'd start it's like market research and uh filtering but making sure you increase that top of funnel and then ensuring you have communication channels with them too. Um, Cause it doesn't really matter if you get a bunch of email, if you get a bunch of like names without emails and their interests, like how do you contact them? So uh, being very deliberate with those communication channels and not trying to spread their awareness too thin. You don't want to say, join our discord, join our email, join our Twitter, join our telegram, follow us on Instagram, you know, like that's way too much. Um, I would recommend, email and then even another thing how would you like to be how would you like to stay in touch and then from there that's when you decide you you look at your data and that's how you actually make decisions on how you stay in touch with them could be email could be personal text message you know but it's, it's up to the it's up to the students yeah and, and as we dig a little bit deeper into academia i mean we're we're going to be talking about how to launch uh, a university class but i think as we said, every school is a little bit different. There's different dynamics, different rules in every school. Um, and I think garnering the support of the professors and the faculty is really important. Um, you see some universities that just have an awesome blockchain presence, right? They have a lot of professors that are you know, top blockchain professors. Maybe they have a huge blog or a huge following. But in other universities, maybe there are some blockchain professors or some blockchain focused groups. Um, but the clubs haven't really fully connected with them and, and really embraced um, that, you know, kind of, ecosystem as a, as a resource of, of professors in academia. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely going to be different. Um, and this is where 
you know, this is part of the reason why I started BAF was because like I was great, you know, fortunate enough to be based in Santa Barbara, California, where the founder of the author of the BAF shell was like showing up to our workshops. Like that's just luck pretty much. Um, I wanted to sort of open up this network. How do we have like an open source network? So, you know, we've gotten this guy to give talks at other schools uh, virtually for the most part, but like, how do we help each other actually grow the space as a whole? So people in, you know, Vanderbilt have the same resources, at least access to remote talent, physical talents, a little bit harder. You need money to fly them there, put them in a hotel, yada, yada, yada. Um, but remotely, at least at the very least, um, same access to people in Berkeley. Um, and so that was part of the motivation here. Uh, there was a saying or like this phrase from uh, Balaji uh, Shivan Yasin. He's old CTO of Coinbase, pretty OG crypto guy. Um, it said, he says, win and help win. And we really took that to heart in, in BAF because, you know, we had the opportunity to win. We had the opportunity to like meet the Ethereum Foundation super early and all these awesome people. So like, how do we pass that on? to people who might not have that opportunity because they're just not in a school on next to some tech hub. Like that is a, a really critical piece. And so that's why BAF kind of one of the motivations why it got started. Um, and for those, so the reason I'm saying all this, is even if your club doesn't have access to all those professors and all those people tap into these networks, like show up to the events, like show up. That is step number one. You got to freaking show up. If you don't show up, I'm not going to help you. Like no one's going to help you. <laughs> um, and I tell people like, if you guys do like 60, 70% of the work and you just expect us to do like 30, like so much better. Like we're actually down to help. Um, so show that you got the grit, connect with other people online, join Twitter spaces, host your own. Like if your club doesn't have that presence uh, on, on campus or like the, the, the faculty doesn't really care about crypto um, because there are even opportunities. I've seen schools where the student club actually attracts faculty to the school because um, a lot of times people uh, want to even go to a school because they've got a good blockchain scene. And uh, you actually as a club have the power to sort of like work towards that. And so um, being sort of unapologetic with your outreach is also something I, I'd suggest. Um, we a little bit spammed some some departments, um, but it worked. And we were able to get, you know, really good faculty on board uh, and really just understanding like how the politics of the school works and the mechanics. Because like at UC schools, and I don't know how if this is the case for other schools, but if you're an official student club on campus, you can pay $300 and email the entire school. Like every student, every faculty, PhD student, like, that's brutal. <laughs> like that's, that's like dozens of thousands of people. And so, um, yeah, we did that and it worked and say, Hey, you have a big speaker, come and talk, email the whole freaking school. The room fills up at the end of the meeting. Hey, sign up. We're looking for XYZ roles, but you got to know what you want in order to like really drive that traction. So, um, yeah, I would say like for those clubs who do have faculty on campus, be relentless with outreach. For those who don't have blockchain native faculty, um, tap the crypto network. The space is so freaking open. Like the co-founder of Nier was on a Twitter space yesterday and like was answering questions from the community. Like I got uh, Sebastian from Laduca. He's like OG BAF guy. Um, he, I could DM Danatoli from Solana and got an internship at Solana, like in the early days. Uh, ended up getting sold super early it mooned, he paid back all the student loans because he DM'd Anatoly, like send it. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be a little relentless and we're happy to help. Like we've, we've done this before. Um, so know what you want, know what you don't know, uh, like learn what you don't know and like ask for help in those when you don't know that. Awesome. We got building a cloud filter, building a flywheel, uh, so many, so many different things to focus on. I guess, you know, let's open up the floor a little bit to like, uh, some of the ways BAF is helping university clubs and, and how, you know, students and, and club leaders can really, uh, you know, interact with BAF and, and use the resources that we're offering. Yeah, so um, it has changed shape over the years. Um, I think we BAF is hitting its four-year anniversary uh, in this month. Um, so in the early days, it was a lot of like much more like tight knit, uh, just university clubs, specifically in California, because I could physically drive there 
and show up. <laughs> um, and then COVID hit and, you know, everything sort of just became totally remote, um, which made providing support much, much clearer. And so what we're doing now is uh, we're much more focused on like the ways in which we pro provide support. And it is sort of ever changing. Um, we finally got money, uh, which is important in order to like actually pay for, you know, I'm not saying we're, we're funding clubs, you know, up the wazoo, hey, come to DevCon and we'll pay for your $2,000 ticket to Columbia. Um, but if your club needs 300 bucks for merch or you want to run a meetup and for whatever reason, the school's not giving you money or whatever, you can come to us for like sort of like basic expenses. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing, um, just connecting with other club leaders is incredibly beneficial. Um, the value that I've received from, you know, just connecting or meeting all these people, especially even in this call, what I love to see is like everyone in this call, if you go get a job in the space, fast forward, like, like in the next year or two, and then you fast forward like four years and you recognize the network effect that that actually happens and your network exponentially increases, uh, with people who are actually in this for the right reasons. Like that is by far one of the most powerful things. Like you have no idea that someone else in this call might be your future co-founder six years down the line. You have no idea. And so um, just creating that that space for people to meet. Uh, we're going to be running uh, a pretty significant uh, program for ETH Denver, getting a lot of students to uh, Denver in February for that large hackathon. I was talking a little bit about it before, as well as a consensus, uh, I believe that's in April, uh, by Coindesk. So two really large conferences I think last year for Coindesk, we got over like 150 students, like, you know, bunkered up in uh, UT Austin's dorm, uh, a lot of free tickets for everyone. Uh, I really hi I re highly recommend like attending these conferences and hackathons, like they could change your life. As I said, the industry is super flat. You can go meet, like I'll be in SF uh, this weekend for uh, ETH SF, like meet me in person, shoot the shit, uh, beer over 21, we can drink a beer. Um, it's just casual. So um, in terms of other ways of support, uh, we've placed a lot of people at jobs in the space. So if you do have, you know, a competitive edge in sort of like your resume or just like you're super specific on something niche or you're you're super interested in like something niche, um, we placed over like, I think there were like 30 or 40 people at jobs in the space. So we do have a significant network of people looking to hire. Um, and so that's pretty dope. Um Oh, on the sort of like actual, and this is a program that we're looking for more capacity for um, fiscal sponsorship. And what this means is you can allocate tax deductions to your donors if they donate to you in crypto, if you leverage our sort of like financial infrastructure. And what that means is uh, you actually have a bank account within our bank account. Um, so we're not extending money outside of our account. Like if FTX gives us Bitcoin, and we turn Bitcoin into dollars and we give ourselves those dollars and just give you a debit card to spend those dollars, um, that's not money transmission. And so we're not sending that money externally. Like your initiatives are our initiatives. And that way we can actually allocate tax deductions to donors um, when they donate in crypto or fiat. And for those who don't know, like tax deductions are a pretty important thing for the US economy <laughs> and uh, a lot of donors want them. So, um, and also it's really neat about, uh, crypto taxes and it's not tax advice. Um, this is just like the law is, um, if you donate crypto, let's say I buy Bitcoin at hundred, uh, donated at a thousand price goes up. If I sold that Bitcoin, I would have to pay capital gains on that $900 difference. But if I donate the Bitcoin at a thousand, I can write off 1000 on my taxable income and that is depending the tax bracket and stuff that you're in. Um, but that's pretty cool because it's essentially a very straightforward way for people who got involved in cryptocurrency early to donate a lot of that crypto. And this is sort of like when I'm talking about incentive aligned systems, uh, donate crypto to accelerate crypto, like through education, where if you donate, you can actually assure that your money is going towards tangible things like getting hungry young people jobs and starting courses at universities. Like this is sort of a, a big motivator of why BAF got started. Um, and uh, yeah, that's like, so we have a sort of fiscal sponsorship. We got jobs, we have uh, a, like conferences. We really like connecting people to uh, like speakers and sponsors. I, I think I see a, a comment in the chat here. Uh, now I work, you know, been at the New York Foundation for the last two years. What's beautiful about that is I have money to sponsor things. 
And sometimes sponsorship is kind of hard to navigate, especially in bear markets, um, because, well, people lost gobs and gobs of money. So um, they're a little, little more hesitant to uh, sponsor things, but sponsorship opportunities are still out there. And so we try our best to like connect sponsors to sponsees. Um, it just depends on uh, our bandwidth, to be honest. And so we are looking to like hire more people. Uh, Makai, I know you just joined. Uh, it's awesome to have you around. Like this is a, a pretty critical thing to uh, you know engage these sponsors more, build that bridge between clubs who need money and the people who are willing to allocate money. Um, so those are those are a few. Um, we can help like even start accredited courses. So this is something we've done a lot historically, but not as much recently. Uh, we'd love to get that program spun up more as long as we can find a head of education because I work at the Near Foundation. I run my own company. Uh, I just hired my ninth person. Um, run Bath, kind of. It's a little too much to do everything. So I can't now build curriculum for these universities. And so we're actually looking to hire a head of education. Um, and that is where we, as I mentioned about uh, starting accredited courses, you can go to the professor with pretty much everything. If you go to them with the curriculum, the students, you just get them to list it. Um, and the hardest thing is finding the TAs um, because the TAs actually want to review the, the homework. Um, and then a lot of times in schools, you need the money to pay TAs um, as like employees of the school. And that's what I mean about like navigating university politics. Um, so we could even, we historically have sourced that money from partners. So like, even if you're like, oh shit, like, no, we don't have 10K to pay these TAs. Like, let us, hit us up. Uh, we know the people who have money to do that. Um, but we need to go to them with like a tangible proposal. And that is actually like the, probably one of the most piece, important pieces of advice I can give is you need to know exactly what you're doing before you ask for money. Because if you ask for money and don't know what you're doing and then slip up, why am I going to give you money again? Like, I want you to really, really be clear on your, on your programming. Um, and yeah, so sponsorship speakers, legal help. Uh, I've gotten calls from people saying, Hey, like student clubs, uh, I'm being investigated by the SEC. Uh, there's some shit that went down. We got them lawyers for free, like pro bono. Like we help in a lot of ways that like is never going to be represented on like our website. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just like good people helping good people. That's, that's the real goal here. Um, and so, yeah, it just really depends on what clubs need. I would say ask for a lot. The worst thing that you can get is a no. Um, and, but don't be a dick if someone's, if we say no and you know, we can't, we can't help you. Uh, that'd be my only request. Hopefully that, that helps. Yeah, let's let's delve deeper into uh, you know starting an accredited course. I think it's an awesome thing that clubs can do um, with the help of BAP. So, I mean, we kind of understand why you should have a, a blockchain course, but let's kind of use an example that we have um, with what BAP has done uh, starting accredited courses before. Yeah, so um, we so we work with the clubs every single time. To be full disclosure. The clubs are the ones that actually are the seed the initiatives. We come in and help them source speakers for their for their classes, help them design the class, help people audit the class. Like you need like somebody like an experts to review that this is the content that should be taught. Um, we help. We've sourced money for those. Uh, so uh, let's use UC Davis as an example. Uh, we started like we work with blockchain clubs to help start block uh, courses at like UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, UT Austin. Uh, University of Florida, UC Santa Barbara, I said UCSB, um, and then like some random classes here and there, or some random like individual classes, not necessarily full courses. Um, and so generally the way it starts is a club says, hey, we really want to start a class. Um, we have a professor who's down. I'll ask like, hey, who's who's actually going to list this class? You can't just like list a class out of nowhere. Um, like what room is it going to be in? Like how many students are looking, are you trying to attract here? Um, and then depending the type of class, um, you will, uh, you know, we help sort of, you essentially, we hop on calls. Like this is when I was like much, much more active, like hand in hand, like supporting clubs. Um, I would hop on like hour, hours and hours and hours of calls with them, uh, walking through their syllabi. 
um, and saying, hey, like maybe we should be teaching about, you know, accounts and gas before diving into solidity. Like there's a lot of like curriculum design that is important to uh, to be had. And so um, we can help with that. Um, this is especially where like a head of education would come in and support. Um, we do have support right now. Even if you are interested in starting a class, like right now, we can we can crowdsource support. There's not like a dedicated person to help you. Um, it's more crowdsourced. Um, so yeah, curriculum design, first thing. Oh, first thing, getting the, the professor there and like, you know, stoked. Um, second thing is you help them design the curriculum. It's a lot of back and forth with those professors and you want them to be involved. Now, you know, distributed systems professor is not going to go explain to you how an automated market maker works unless they do their homework. Um, but what you can get them involved with is like, hey, why don't you teach the first three courses on, you know, Byzantine, like just general consensus, things that they know, um, get them involved. Um, and, you know, things like Byzantine fault tolerance are taught in like every single distributed systems class, like these professors can teach that. Um, if it's a business class, um, again, just like understand what the core competencies are of that professor and get them involved. Um, and then if your student, if the, if your club actually has people in it that can teach, hell yeah, like much better. Um, but like a lot of times that's not the case or you even, even if it is the case, universities aren't always cool with like students teaching. Um, by the way, that is how most PhD programs work. It's just PhD students teaching PhD students. So um, think of it more like a grad class, um, like this class that you're starting. So uh, then you design the class, you got the student interests, you drive it, you actually, like when the class goes live, you ping your friends in the club and saying, hey, register. Because what the professor really wants is for that class to be filled up. So the school recognizes as important. And so... Um, but you're also going to need like a TA, maybe even two, depending on the class size. Um, and you got to make sure that TA is like hyper, like super competent to grade the homework. Um, in terms of designing classes, I try not to give a lot of homework. Um, I make it more project based. And again, not all professors are down for this, but that's what the industry really wants. The industry wants to prove that you actually can ship something. Um, and so making it like ma lectures mandatory. Uh, this is kind of controversial in a lot of colleges, but like lectures mandatory, uh, very little homework, lots of assigned reading, maybe some random pop quizzes, like short, short, short questions, like one sentence quiz, like, hey, have you actually like, did you read the thing that you're supposed to read? Um, and then uh, have everything sort of like revolve around, no final exam, just revolve around this project. And then plug in with external resources in the ecosystem, in, in the space, uh, to support those projects maybe after they launch. So I think something that we've did a few, uh, done a few times was the final project was actually just a grant proposal. Like I think we forked the uh, Web3 Foundation uh, grant proposal and said, hey, you need to build a product, build an MVP, draft a grant, like a full grant with like business model, whole bit, and you can get a grade for that. Now, if the student really wants to take that project to the next step, you already have the grant proposal, just submit it. With your MVP, like I help stand up the grant program at the Near Foundation. Like I know how these things kind of work, and it's a very, very straightforward uh, path towards success. If you have a robust grant proposal, you've done your market research, you have an MVP. It's pretty straightforward um, to get not a ton of money, but just a little bit of money to kind of get you sort of going in the space. So um, my advice. Make sure you have a team to manage class. Make sure you build a proper syllabus. Make sure you got the TAs. Make sure you got the professor on board. Uh, make sure you have uh, uh, money to pay the TAs. Uh, make it more project oriented. Um, I don't know. Did I miss anything? <laughs> I kind of rambled for a bit, but uh, hopefully that helps. That's a that's an awesome blueprint for starting an accredited course. And I mean, as we were talking about earlier. You don't want to be doing this for clout, right? But that's going to give your club clout and people are going to work at a club that has clout, right? And, um, you know, really try to to separate themselves in the industry. Um, so, I mean, having that, you know, as a, as a success story for your club is going to be something awesome. Um, what is like one critical action step? What, what's the first thing to kind of break the ice for, for clubs when it comes to starting this course? Uh, yeah, uh, just, to, I want to answer the question, but... Um... 
a little bit aside on what you said, like we got Coindesk and Cointelegraph to cover our courses. Like we, we can plug, we have network, like we can, we know Coindesk very well. Um, we can, like, if you start a class and it's successful, like it might be newsworthy. Be like, Hey, there's this club actually doing something cool. So, um, it is super clout worthy. And also, sorry, Makai, I might ask you to ask the question again, but, uh, when I add into this other thing, uh, honestly, the best people I've worked with in this space, um, aren't American. They're generally international students. And why that's important is because international students, uh, want to come to the country and they need, they can go for this like, Oh, one visa that, uh, essentially indicates that they are a important person for the country to, 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 to house and give a visa to. So these people are, uh, really important to include when, if you do have any like hackathon or, um, social, like any big, like media announcement, like get their name in it, uh, because it will actually increase their chances of staying in the country and getting a visa exponentially. Um, so just want a little aside there because, um, I know that a lot of people in this space, uh, aren't native Americans or <laughs> are not native Americans. <laughs> they are not, uh, born in the United States. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's, it's good to get uh, them involved in that way, but sorry for the digression. Yeah, I mean, that that was really important, um, something really to to think about and really embrace because there's so many international students, you know, here in the U.S. as well. And I think, you know, really making clubs inclusive are really important. Um, yeah, so I guess just as we kind of wrap things up here, um, wh what would one kind of critical action step be? Just like if, if, if a club wanted to start an accredited course as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, make sure your team is aligned on it. Like, make sure it's not just like you as a solo person, like pushing this forward. Um, making sure that you have like have that initial team to help you because it's a shit ton of work. Like, it's a shit ton of work. Um, and yeah, you have the time. It's not something that you're going to start and, and drop off because um, if you do that, the professor is going to think you're not worthwhile to work with. Um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta stay persistent. So that's one thing, have the team, um, and make sure you have the faculty on board. That's, that's a, it's a critical piece. Hopefully yeah, that answers. Awesome. All right. That was a, that was a great conversation. So many, so many things covered. I think we're all going to have to go back and, and watch through this. Uh, right now we're going to open it up for a little bit of Q and A. I noticed some, some good questions in the chat, but, uh, you know, uh, anybody feel free to to reach out um and and let's let's chat a little bit about some of these things so yeah sean uh i see your question uh would you give any tips on how clubs uh, could pull more sponsorship money to send students to hackathons etc yeah um absolutely so i send students to hackathons um and uh the important thing is you guys need to know what your donors want Yes, giving money is, you know, we want more people in Web3, we want people to come to the hackathons, but like, I am not incentivized to pay you, Sean, to go to the hackathon, Solana Hacker House from near. I'm not incentivized to do that. Um, there's no real like return on investment for, for me. Now, I'm not saying return on investment needs to be monetary, but, you know, having a pitch and framing the why is very important to who you're raising money from. If you're trying to, you know, go to a Solana hacker house, how do you recommend trying to raise money from Solana? Um, if you're trying to, you know, and if they're not interested, maybe it could be projects building in the Solana ecosystem or the near ecosystem. Like I run a company called near hacks. Um, we have not form formally like onboard, like had these giant programs to bring students over yet because we're sort of just getting our feet uh it's just standing everything up like that will come eventually um so making sure you know what your donors want is step one uh step two is make it super freaking easy for them to say yes um don't have this conversation go back and forth back and forth back and forth like you want to say hey we're looking and be super specific we're looking for X amount of money to bring these amount of students that have this background to attend this event at this day, at these times to build these things, or like, you know, uh, at this time, um, we're going to be staying at this place. It's going to cost this much um, because I don't want to give 
if you're going to be like, hey, I need $10,000 to bring three people to the town next over, I'm like, no fucking way. I'm not giving you 10K. Um, but if you're saying, hey, um, and make it ask reasonable, don't go get some crazy big house. You stay in a, a modest place. You can you can, you can can do it right. Um, and so one, know what your sponsors want. Um, what's beautiful about Nier, I'll do a little bit of a shameless plug, is that um, it's WASM based. So we can actually sponsor people to go to people to build in Solidity, JavaScript, Rust, assembly script, substrate, like that's why I ended up joining Nier, to be honest, is I could teach people skills and allow them to deploy on where they want to deploy. That is very different than, you know, having people just learn cadence for flow um, or like, you know, PyTeal for Algorand. Like it's just not as compelling for, for the students. And so, um, yeah, know what your sponsors want is one. Be super clear with your ask. Um, create a deck. Even, not even a deck, you know, it could be a, it could be a notion doc. It could be like super simple. The people who you're raising money from are super busy. Like to be, don't take this the wrong way, but like your club is not our priority. Like we're building an open internet. Like we're trying to build a new economy. It's a piece of the puzzle, but the clearer that you can be with your requests, the higher likelihood you have to success. So um, keep it bullet points, like absolute bullet points. And then if you've done this a few times, have some success story. Say like, oh, hey, we came to the hackathon and our people built this thing and they got third place. Awesome. Like so much more compelling. Hopefully hopefully that helps. Thanks. Really helpful. Cool. Um, should I just read Who from else we got? Yeah, let's, let's go for it. Uh, Zhongguan, you want to you wanna ask your question? I could... Actually, you kind of answered it along the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Um, so, so actually, I could get more specific here. So like, what do sponsors want to gain? Um, also, I'm in the process. So I'm leaving the Near Foundation. It's kind of a kind of weird thing. Um, and I'm leaving the Near Foundation to start a new company uh, called the Banding Collective. And its goal is to actually uh, scale Near in the United States, but much more like, eco, like bottom-up approach instead of being like so top-down. Uh, what does this mean? Well, I love to work with more clubs, um, actually get them to do not just like, oh, come to this hackathon, but how do we like work together to do analysis on why ref or like our primary AMM decks is called ref finance, why ref V2 is different than Uniswap V3 and having someone write a Twitter thread about it. Like if you prove yourselves in like small ways, I am so much more likely to support your club, uh, longer term and, uh, I'm doing this right now. So uh, brokering a partnership with like Blockchain Columbia. They had this big conference, sponsored the conference. I gave them more money than they asked for the conference. And I said, hey, why don't we work together on, you know, X, Y, Z other things? They now have the budget to send people to conferences and stuff. And so the reason why I did Columbia and I'm happy to work with other schools is because I'm trying to scale specifically right now. We will scale outside of these two places, but San Francisco and New York, we're just getting started. Um, these are my hubs. I literally have people living there right now, um, like to dedicated to it, but I would like to work with all of you and give it five months. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't start working on stuff sooner. Um, that's just like, I'm not down to like give like a big chunk of money because it will buy and I don't have that money right now. Um, but the, uh, the point is like find little ways that you can engage, provide value. And then I'm 10 X more likely to actually like support longer term and come to me with a plan. Cause I don't want to try to guess your strategy. I want you to say, Hey, this is what we want to do. This is how we see you supporting us. Um, this is what we get. This is what you get. Bada boom, bada bing. Now we got a deal. So hopefully that helps. Awesome. Thank you. Um, CT asks, uh, what's your perspective about blockchain education for business school students? What should they learn to co-found a startup with the techies? G amazing question. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not a programmer. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I, sure, I've, I've built things. I freaking suck. I hate it. I don't love sitting in front of the computer um, all day and typing. Um, I, but I read a lot. Um, you read white papers, um, like you read the white paper, attend academic conferences, even if you don't know shit, even if you don't understand 99% of the things that they say, 
and you pick up on that 1% and you're there with your friends to help explain the things that you don't know. Um, like I did not study computer science, uh, but in the last like, you know, six years I've been in the space, like I can read solidity contracts. I can read Rust contracts. Um, I'm not the best person to write them, but you can become more technical, even though you're a business person. Doesn't mean you need to build the thing, but you need to speak the language. You need to know how these systems operate because it is deep tech. Like we are talking about, um, you know, super complex distributed systems topics. So like do your research, uh, meet friends who make friends who like are genuinely interested in like the science side of things. Um, and ask compelling questions. Like, don't don't feel bad about asking stupid questions. Um, and so, yeah, join hackathons. Like, even participate in a hackathon if you if you have ideas. Like, go out there because there's a lot of programmers who have great skills who have not saying they have bad ideas. They just have, they just they need some help. Um, and so you can go there being more like the project manager of the thing. And even if they build like some minimal viable product. By the end of the by the end of the hackathon, if you're able to go get them like some sense of adoption or even like some uh, some general proof of concept that this thing is is working in the wild, you're more likely to win that hackathon. So uh, you got to put yourself out there. Uh, we'll have to hop off. Okay, uh, great. Anyone else? Any last questions? Feel free to turn your mic on. Hey, I had one more question. Um, I wanted to ask uh, what your thoughts are on non-accredited blockchain education, how effective that can be and the right way to do it. Yeah, uh, it can be super, super compelling. Um, focus on quality over quantity would be my, my, my recommendation. Like you could even do, if the high, high quality like learners already know what a blockchain is. They don't want to do a blockchain 101. They want to do a white paper circle where you unpack, you know, how SUI is different than Aptos, or why you know uh, why sharded blockchains and roll-up based solutions are going to be dealing with the same asynchronous issues with like scaling, like why they're how atomic swaps are going to work in both environments, like they're going to care about the stuff. So like focus on quality over quantity, like for sure. Um, or just if they're more interested in going back to like the market research side, if they're interested in programming do programming workshops. Um, and so it just depends on, on what your people want. Thank you. It's up to you to figure that out. That's the point. It's up to you to figure it out. Yeah. Guys, I have to hop. Um, I would love to stay in touch. If you're in San Francisco uh, this week and uh, you hit me up at Cameron Dennis on Telegram, um, or just hit me up anyway, introduce yourself. Uh, or I know there's like a bath chat, hopefully with every one of your clubs. Um, happy to stay in touch, support your orgs. Um, uh, thanks for joining today. Like I do absolutely take note of like who shows up because it does matter. Um, so good shit. And, uh, yep. Please contact Alexis and, uh, anyone else in the bath team and Makai with, uh, any questions, concerns, or, you know, better ways that you would like to get involved with bath. So. Hopefully it helps. Awesome. Thank you, Cameron. Great having you tonight. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you.